This video was originally streamed fall 2020 and is a part of the Tibet House U.S. Menla online offerings. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. And let's just say we have tonight one of our very favorite people on uh, our our Buddhaverse planet, uh, which is uh, the one and only Robert Thurman. And uh, Bob is here with us tonight to talk about, you know, also another land of the snows, uh, uh, really in Tibet, this, these really multiple living, totally energizing, totally transformational experiences of ritual, with incredible depth of myth that is alive and moving forward, not moving backward. And what does it mean to actually clarify your own thought, your own emotion, actually become skilled with visualization so that you're actually able to hold in front of you multiple universes, enter them, float, lighten your being, illuminate yourself and what's around you, and move forward with a different kind of alertness, awareness, kindness, and blessing. And again, the focus of this class is blessing at a time when everybody knows how to curse. How do you bless? What is blessing and how do we come become skilled at blessing and not just remember after everything oh right i should have blessed that person or let them bless me but actually that it's the first thing you think and that you're blessing every situation you're in because the negative energy is everywhere you, you can't miss that so we actually have to consciously make sure that the energy of blessing and transformation is at our fingertips and use it. Bob, thanks for coming tonight. <laughs> it's so great you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've asked people to look at the Jewel Tree of Tibet, one of our favorite okay. books ever, 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 ever. Okay. okay. Of course, there's a little inner revolution on the on the reading list, and of course. I also asked people to look at Gesar of Ling if they wanted to, just to get okay. the superhuman, you know, amazing, yes, yes. amazing there. level of 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 existence. That's their Iliad and Odyssey. And yes, our Ling. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, that's great. Although Peter, you are leading us on to the visualization path. I think Peter himself is from Tibet. <laughs> He's totally. He's a Tibetan at heart. <laughs> and uh, Tibet, in a way, is all over the planet now. You know? it's very, I wanted to start then by uh, doing a ritual, since you asked me to do that. And you see these two things in my hand. This one is a bell, and it has a, a Vajra handle. And this is a Vajra, what's called a Vajra, which is a little scepter-like thing like this. And when you start to, uh, and you ring that bell, and the sound of that bell is intended to lead your mind to embrace reality. And reality is considered to be something like a great mother, actually. It's not a father creative God, creator God. There are father deities, but there's no creator in their worldview, in their myth. And this bell is the sound of, and the symbol of, what is called the clear light of the void, which is the deepest nature of reality, according to Indian insight originally from Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years ago, who came to an understanding of reality, he thought. He met with gods, 
you know, the people who analyze religions have trouble with him because he did meet with the gods of the era, the one who at his time was thought to be by many the creator, and various other ones who are something like maybe archangels or other right gods of different types in India of his era, 2,500 years ago, 2,600 years ago. And uh, that God, instead of telling him, be my prophet, because I, I'm all powerful and I can save everybody, like the usual religion founder, that God said, hey, listen, I didn't create it all. Don't blame me. <laughs> he said, I'm really powerful. And actually, I was first person around when this universe re arose and I came from previous universe. And I was the first more very powerful being here. But I didn't create the whole thing. So, and I'm not even quite sure how it happens, but I can tell, I am clairvoyant kind of, and I'm, because I'm, I'm a zillion years old, and I know you're going to figure it out. And you have figured it out, actually, then later he told them. And I want you to tell the human beings that I love them, and I do the best for them. And I don't mind if they respect and revere me when they are going, when things are happy for them. But when horrible things happen to them, which do happen, I don't want to be blamed. I didn't create it all. I'm not responsible. And Buddha, you tell them, you explain that we're all in it together. And there's a causation of what happens to us. And uh, the word for a ritual act in Buddha's world was karma, which just actually means an action. But the people of his day believed that they were gods. This god, some of them thought he was a creator, Brahma, his name, Brahma. And some thought they were plurality, plurality of creator types. But they all considered that they were the power of the world, of the universe. And therefore, you had to perform rituals to coerce them or entice them or propitiate them, meaning make them feel close to you or please them, uh, to favor you and your goals in life, which were success, longevity, power, prosperity, and victory in battle because they were fighting occasionally. And um, that would come to you through making the right ritual offerings to the gods. And Buddha, Buddha, when he refused to participate in that society in which he would have been a king, uh, he told his dad, look, uh, I want to help beings. Like I was raised to, a king is supposed to help their subjects and save them from their troubles. And, uh, but, but the king can't do that. That's not, it's a wrong job for job description for a king. Because what they need help with their problems or people are sickness, old age, death, pain. Those are their problems. And kings can't help them with that. They can do economy, health, education, welfare. They can help protect them against plagues if they care to. They can do something like that. But that's not their biggest problem. Their problem is that the king can't help them with death, can't help them with the existential issue of what is life. King doesn't do that. So his father then said, oh, leave that to the priests. That's what the high priests do. They do rituals for the gods, and then the gods take care of it. And Buddha said, well, if the gods are taking care of it, they're doing a crappy job. What they're coming up with sucks. And I think I can do better, he said. You know, he was, he was 29, actually. He'd already been married. He had a son. And he said, yeah, I'm going to go and find out how things really work, what is the real cause of things. What is how to produce really better effects, how to improve the world, how to save the world. And I'm going to become truly know what, how to do it, what human life is about. And he went off and he spent six years studying, meditating, learning everything he could. And finally, one morning he said, Eureka, I understand. I really do. Wow, I knew I could. He said, I feel good. And I knew that I would. That's what he said. And he gave a bunch of teachings about how you, everyone should feel good if they knew what they were, if they knew what their reality was. 
if they knew how to count their blessings. And he announced the discovery of what he called Nirvana. And Nirvana is not a name of, it is the name of many restaurants actually. <laughs> around the world. There used to be a really nice one in New York on Central Park South overlooking the park called Nirvana. The South Indian cooking was really good. But Nirvana means a state free of suffering. It doesn't mean the extinction of life as people have misunderstood it because people are so depressed about life because they're sensitive and there's a lot of pain in life. And people, and they're taught a lot of unrealistic teachings. Like for example, that you're supposed to feel pain if you're sort of resigned to suffering, living in the veil of the shadow, valley of the shadow of death and pain and suffering and blah, blah, blah. That that's supposed to be realistic and you're supposed to be resigned to that. And then if you do that and you still pray to the forces that powers that be outside yourself, they'll install you in the choir up there with Beatrice and Dante and Peter Sellers, where you'll be singing hymns. And after you die, but be, in life, you should be miserable. And if you're not, and, and we all believe that, we all bought that. Look at you. If your roommate comes back to your house or room, I don't know where you are. I know you're doing remote learning at UCLA. If your roommate comes back one day and they say, wow, and, they, and they're singing James Brown, you know, I feel good or, 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 or it's all right, you know, what's his name? The blind one, the really lovely one. You know, you know who I mean, Ray, Ray, Ray Charles. And, and they and like said, I'm so happy. And then you say, well, what, what's happened to you? What, what are you doing? They say, well, I don't know. I'm just so happy. I just, it, I really feel good. It's really, I love life. It's great. I love it. Well, how do you feel about that? What do you first thing that you say? What did you drink? What are you smoking? What did you take? Are you in trouble? What's where, the, when is the crash coming? Calm down. To here, have a Librium, have a tranquilizer, take a Prozac, be cool, go to sleep. Don't you? And if you feel like that, you sort of hide it because you know the people might think you're crazy or stoned. Right? But we're conditioned like that. And Buddha said, no way. The human life is a product of an evolution, not just of a species that every human has undergone as an individual who has had infinite previous existences in all different life forms. And they, like Darwin, they have struggled to improve their intelligence and their sensitivity and their, and their knowledge and their, especially that intelligence. So they know what's real, so they don't get eaten up when they do this and that. And actually the more intelligent, the final intelligence means you have to cooperate with others. You have to have compassion for them better to be a mammal, better to be born by a mom, even, even a, a tiger is better than a lizard. It's when moms just lay you as an egg and leave you in the sand somewhere, they take off for the ocean. Well, it's six to one, half a dozen to another, whether you're gonna make the ocean when the egg cracks and mom is not there to look out for you. So it's better to be in a mom and moms are insanely altruistic, giving free space without rent, squatters rights in their belly, for nine, 10 months, mammal moms are amazing. That's why they, you know, that, that's not, it's not automatic. Which guy is about to do that? What do the guys know about that even? <laughs> let, let me out of here. What, hello? Somebody talking to you down there? No, I don't want chocolate, I want strawberries. Is it affecting your diet and everything? So then human among the compassionate animals is the most compassionate one. We, they can be most vicious because they are so smart. We're so smart. We can make nuclear weapons and obliterate the planet. But we are also really can, are capable of extreme pleasure. We're capable of extreme sensitivity and altruism. And actually we're capable of awakening to reality. The human brain is able to understand the real. The scientists tell you, you can't understand the real. The religious people tell you only God does, you can't. That's why I didn't like them when I was a kid in school like you. I refused. What are you talking about? If a human being is unable to understand the world, then you don't understand the world. Then how come you're telling me with a conviction that I can't understand it? That's what I used to say to the pastors and the professors. 
And science, they, they, do, they don't understand. They always pretend they're going to understand after the next round of billion dollar funding. But then they say, the more you learn, the more you don't know. That's what they say. And that's what we're supposed to accept. And that's not the Tibetan myth, if you will. Now about myth, you know, Peter asked me to talk about myth. Myth has two meanings. One is a narrative that creates meaning around something that societies use to explain things and uh, to feel meaningful in the way they live. And some of them are sensible and some of them are senseless. But they, they are like a narrative. You know, if you, if you have trouble in life and you go to a shrink, the shrink's talking cure, what that is, is it's changing your narrative. You had a myth that your parents caused all your trouble by behaving, by, the, by passing on their problems to you. And, uh, and often you will be blaming the parents for a while as you create your transference with the therapist who creates a new parent parenting for you. And then he changes the narrative or she changes the narrative for you. And you come up with a plausible reason of why you're the way you are. And then you're able to go ahead. So like an individual has a narrative about what life is about. Cultures have a narrative. And so myth in that sense is not really the other meaning of myth is a false idea. I just looked up in the dictionary, uh, something that isn't true, it's myth and fact, you know, myth and, it's like fact and fiction, fact versus myth. So myth is like fiction. But, you know, it's questionable whether in true science, for example, Buddhist science from ancient times, there is no absolute description of the nature of reality. That's why I love Buddha, he's so great. Buddha sat there after these seven years of Syria. He'd been educated also before that to be a king, you know, so he was very knowledgeable, very capable. And then he spent six years in internal investigation, you could say, and uh, mind traveling all over the universe and figuring it out. And then he said, wow, I understand everything and it is really great and I love it. And I have good news for, for you. Unfortunately, my news doesn't include an explanation because I can't really explain it to you, what I've understood, it, because it's inexplicable. It's, it's beyond our categories of explanation. So therefore there's no dogma I'm giving you that you can just hold on to that dogma and then that theory will save you if you believe it. So you, I'm not asking you to believe anything. What I'm saying is I can help you find a way of experiencing life beyond any description of it, beyond even a poet's way of ev evoking different aspects of it, which poets are better, deeper, because they don't pretend they're can nail it down in some surefire dogmatic way of explaining it. They just can find some kind of way of improving our way of experiencing. You know, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of mankind, you know, that famous statement of Shelley, I believe. And uh, so that was Buddha. So there's no dogmas in Buddhist science in the sense that reality defies description. But you can provide a curriculum, a way of study and in a way of deconditioning yourself from the way you're brainwashed in your society to accept the authoritarian models of society that you're given. Like Buddha was given an authoritarian one where he had to obey his father and be a king when the father wanted to abdicate. He had to obey the priest who told him what God wanted and he had to follow that. And he rebelled against that. And he said, that doesn't make sense to me. This authority, your authority is based on your ignorance. Therefore, I can't accept it. I'm gonna find out for myself what reality is. And actually he discovered that reality is this, is what this bell stands for, for the clear light of the void. And let me just say what that clear light is. First of all, I can't say what it is. So everything I say, you could say the opposite. <laughs> However, what I can say can be helpful if it can help you open your mind to thinking in such a way and trying to experience directly something yourself. So it can be helpful to you, but I'm not saying that just any way I say is what it will be, but it's something paradoxical. Just imagine that what reality is, is an infinite energy. It's not the base of reality, if you, Experiment, experiment yourself. What you think reality is based on our materialist culture, how you were educated and brought up. What do you think if you reduce everything to the, to the absolute reductionism, what do you end up with in your mind? 
if you sit down and take everything apart, analyze it, dissect it, take everything that you see apart and everything that you think apart, what do you end up with? Nothing. And that means nothing as like a blank dark space, like the one between the stars, you know, the one that if the, the guy gets out for a spacewalk without the Michelin man suit, he explodes because there's no pressure there because supposedly it's nothing. So when they, when they look for when the, in the, the, the quantum people, when they look down at the micro thing, they, they said in the Copenhagen, after a few beers in Copenhagen, good Danish beers, they said, you can't get down and pinpoint an irreducible particle, subatomic particle. You can't. You get down to that micro level and your active observation interferes with it. And there's nothing objective there. So in a way, everything dissolves under analysis and you end up with nothing. And that's what we think is real. And at night you go to sleep and where do you go? You go in the dark room, you turn off the light, you shut off the sound or you put in earplugs, you snuggle on your pillow, you lock the doors and you go into a dark space. And so in a way you're, you're, you're happy to go to nothing actually, you're not even scared of it. Some people do and then they take an Ambien because <laughs> you have to sleep, okay? So you assume you go to nothing. Now imagine that that is not sensible. Why? Guess what? News flash. There is no nothing. When, when you don't find something you're looking for, you don't find nothing. That's just an expression. You just don't find what you were looking for. And you don't find nothing because nothing isn't there to be found, right? So you can't go to nothing. So any of you who think that just by dying, you get out of all the problems and you just become nothing and you don't have that headache anymore. You don't have that shame, that embarrassment, that, that whatever it is, that's wrong because you're a continuum of energy and the energy is never destroyed and your awareness is a very subtle continuum of energy. Don't you think your awareness is something like it makes lightning flashes inside your brain. Little mini lightnings will zip, 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 zap and you remember your name and you know how to who you voted for. <laughs> you do, right? That's energy. So that's never destroyed. Once it's not in the brain, it goes somewhere else. When you dream, where is it? You think it's all just only inside the brain? But you can be in Paris or in outer space or have a sci-fi dream. You know, you, you don't know where you are. People dream actually, and they talk to other people in dreams and then the other people notice that in some cultures. They can communicate with other people who are also dreaming. And uh, so my point is just imagine that in fact, the base reality is infinite energy. Now, what would, it, what would infinite energy be like? it would be completely quiescent, wouldn't it? it? Because it's infinite, so it would have nothing to do. Think about that. That's a paradox. That doesn't make sense in a way, but it also it's logical. The energy is completely inexhaustible and infinite. And therefore, and it's everywhere, and it is everything. You could say like it's the substance of everything, but it doesn't do it itself, it doesn't create the things. But anybody who's creating things can draw on it without it being exhausted. That's, we call that the clear light of the void. And in the clear light, it's like light, but it's clear. The clarity part is more important. Than Another translation would be, pravasvara would be transparency, okay? But in a way then that fits with theistic people thinking God is love. You know, they think that Allah al-Rahim, or God is love, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, uh, John's gospel, or Krishna, the loving God, you know, etc. You know, that they're, the idea of love, because what is love? Love is defined in, at least in Sanskrit, <laughs> and it should be, I think, in, in Greece, of the wish for the happiness of the beloved. So love is joy and delight in the happiness of the, of the beloved. Greed and selfish, selfish, Desire is not really love in that sense. It's just because it's one's own happiness. One is seeking and using someone else for that purpose. And we, we sometimes do call that love too, but, but love, true love is considered love and love. That, and if you have infinite energy that is infinitely drawable by anybody that needs energy, then that's the equivalent of love. It's whatever you need, just take it. And that's reality. 
That's nirvana. That's the reality the Buddha discovered, clear light of the void. That's why he smiled. That's why he was happy. He didn't discover suffering. That's, so people, and if you hear, some Buddhists will say, oh yeah, Buddha discovered suffering. That's ridiculous. Doesn't take a Buddha to discover suffering. Just stub your toe and you know about suffering. You don't have to be enlightened. But to be to discover that reality is basically positive, it's basically love, it's basically abundance of energy. And that energy is free and it's, in, it's totally available and everybody knows how to access it. And not only that, but we, we ourselves touch it. Did you ever wonder why you feel refreshed in the morning when you sleep at night? You know, you're really exhausted. You had to take exams. You had to work all day. You had to take care of five children. You had to do this, that, the other. You had to be president. You had to do some horrible job. And, and you go pass out and you just don't want to think about it after 16 hours of it or 18 hours, whatever it is. After three all-nighters for exams. And then you wake up and you, wow, you're ready to go. Well, where did that energy come from? Did that come from the dark nothing that you, you think you're ratifying when you fall asleep? that the base of reality is nothing? No, nothing would have nothing to give you. You should feel exactly as you felt when you fell asleep, but you feel better. Why? Somewhere energy is coming to the cells in your body. Where does it come from? According to Buddha, it's because when you get your consciousness out of the way by being unconscious, by voluntarily sleeping, in other words, opening your boundary because actually when you're unconscious, whatever can happen, you have no control. That's why some people get nervous when they can't sleep. But you, you are used to waking up feeling better, so you want to sleep when you're tired, right? And where does that energy come from? From the clear light of the void. The void also is not a nothing. People are only wrong. The void is the fact that all relative things lack any non-relative component. That is to say, you, your identity, you don't have an identity meaning a fixed essential thing that's you, like a barcode, like a little mini homunculus that's you, like, like whatever it might be. You, you don't have like your name, like Bob. There's no Bob engraved on my heart chakra or my brain somewhere, some neuron, there's Bob. Bob is there like one of those things you wear in high school, like Cynthia. <laughs> there isn't any such thing. You, people change their name. Now you're Cynthia, now you're Cindy, now you're, you don't like the name anymore. You get divorced and you say, I'm going to be Rebecca. I'm going to be Kamala. I want to call myself Kamala and I'm going to change my name to Kamala. You might say. So there's nothing that's about us that stays the same. We are constantly living, changing. Every cell in our body is replaced within some short period of time. It's great what scientists have discovered. Sci I love scientists except I don't like the dogmas about materialism, but otherwise with refusal to look at something more subtle. But you know what I discovered recently? I was in conversation with a physicist. Do you know, did you ever hear of a photon? Do you know what that is? A photon is supposed to be a particle of light so that you explain seeing the, and the, and the gallery view here of the zoom, you see the other faces and everything by the fact that there's light they're illuminated and photons bounce off them in their home there in Los Angeles or wherever they are, <laughs> come to the camera, come through the camera, transmitted in some inconceivable manner, and they then are broadcast and show up on my screen. And those are all a bunch of photons going zzzz, and then they interact with the optical neurons in the nerves, the little subatomic particles, and then that goes zzzz, and then and then my I bring up in my memory bank, I pick up an image of what Peter looked like last time I saw him, which was a very different shirt than the one he's wearing now, but I cannot recognize the shirt he's wearing now. And I say, oh, Peter Sellers, with a big grin on his face. All right, those are all photons. But did you know something? Well, this physicist told me actually photons are a pure myth. They're a fiction. Why? You know what speed of light, why in Einstein's theory, speed of light is that is a kind of absolute parameter. Did you know what, do you know that limit? You know why? Because at the speed of light, a supposed photon, its mass becomes infinite. So therefore it can't go any faster because it's already everywhere. Ah! Therefore, when it's a particle, it's not light. 
because it's, it's not up to speed. And it's just actually an analogy that they use to try to account for the weird fact that light can be differentiated into different colors and things and we can perceive things and structure and organize you know, what is a buzzing, blooming confusion of waves or particles. They don't know what it is, really. They don't. And, they, and besides which, it's all surrounded by dark matter and energy, which luckily is not nothing. It's just dark. <laughs> and they, they haven't seen that yet. But they're just on the brink of understanding the nature of reality. Sure. So my point is, this light is like that, in a way, Einstein is touching the clear light in the sense of an infinite presence, infinite mass, which is light. And it's at a speed which seems like a speed to us relatively, but if it's already everywhere, it's not, there's no speed. It doesn't even move. And th that is at the deepest level of sub, I have a new expression for it, not subatomic. I call it subparticulate energy. Do you like that expression? Subparticulate, no particles. This is Buddhist science. Just pure waves, pure energy, infinitely everywhere. And if you become conscious at that level, that's being, that's your Buddha. And, and being conscious at that level without losing the ability to be conscious at every other structured level within life structured by people who are operating under the delusion that we are all operating on, I assume, unless one of you is a Buddha, which I know Peter might be. I don't know, but he has a Buddha smile for sure. I think he's actually changed his cheeks and his jaw to encompass his marvelous smile. Look at that. I can't quite, I can't even, my mouth will not, my cheeks are not that mobile. I have to work on them to achieve a Peter Seller smile. Really? I'm not flattering you, Peter. It's a really out there smile. And my point is that uh, that's a Buddha smile. And that's a smile of someone who suddenly knows clear light. They know that their cheek is made of light. They know that their organs and their heart is made of light. The tree is made of light. Everything is subparticulated energy that shapes itself and comes and constructs the particles and makes up such seemingly solid thing. The tree is not solid. That screen is not solid. Even the scientists will tell you it's like atom. And what is atom? It has a nucleus and an electron out in the bleacher someplace, mostly empty space. And then again, nothing in this empty space you, they're supposed to think. But there's never, there's never nothing. Space is not nothing either. It's, it's a something, you know, cosmic rays go through space. Sound goes across space. It's not nothing. It's a medium for waves. And so are we. And then, and we can reach that when we go into flow. How many of you have ever been in a flow state? Some of you jogging, running, doing yoga. Hard, it's hard to do it meditating, but meditation can achieve flow state also, very much so. But it's, it takes effort because mind is always moving and distracting itself. So to develop the concentration to reach flow state, sitting still is very difficult. But sometimes running people do it, or people who are great at musicians, artists, singing, playing their thing, losing themselves, or even writers when they lose themselves in the writing. Sometimes that happens to me. I'm a translator and I, I, the, I love these Sanskrit books that I translate. And, and I, get, I get up in the morning and I get to work on it. And then I've made a page and a half or even a few lines, some really difficult one. And I look up things and do this and that. And then suddenly, dear, come help make supper. I'm, I'm not making it by myself. The day is gone like that. Just time, finish, because I get into a flow state with it. So the point is flow is where it's at. You know? Did you ever think that? You know, the, the materialist scientists make a big fuss about mind. Oh, mind, mind does not matter. So we can't deal with mind. No, 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 everything is matter. We're not gonna look at mind. We're not gonna look at ourselves with our, we're not gonna examine, we're gonna look at our microscope that we use to examine things. But we're not looking at the mind with which we decide to look through the microscope. We don't look at that. That was it's just a brain. Brain is tricking us into thinking we have a mind. That's so ridiculous, really. It really is ridiculous. Meanwhile, light is everywhere. That's why it's a it's an absolute for a materialist. And actually, beyond the speed of light, there's different kinds of light at different speeds. It's only the mind 
a subparticulate mind, which is pure energy, can reach, which is Buddha enlightened energy. Okay, so so that's the thing. So so the Tibetan myth, if you will, which is just a model of reality, and they they are they they give you the caveat that whatever they say about it is just a model. So they're not saying myth is false and there's some sort of material fact that is true. They're saying that reality is indescribable, but it is experienceable. That is you, and you do it every day, by the way. You know, sometimes you, when you have an extraordinary experience, I bet every one of you has had it. You wouldn't be in Peter's course if you weren't into the arts, probably, in some way. I hope film, which is the great art and the great teaching of our era and the future. You know, you make a documentary, that's better than 10 hours of lecture. You know, you really show people what it is, your point you're trying to get across. So you're into art. So you know that when you really do something great, that's really beautiful, is when you give yourself to it and you're not calculating, is this cute? Are they gonna like it? And this, why can I sell it? Can I do that? When you're doing that, you might be, that's where you can prepare and pump yourself up. But once you really deliver, you lose it. Like Joe Cocker, you know, like, ah, you are so beautiful. He's like having epileptic fit practically. He just gave his body to it. Hip hop artists are like that. James Brown, uh, uh, you know, Ray, you know, what's his name? All the wonderful artists. They, they, they lose themselves. They don't know what they're going to say next when they really in on. And that's why they have this impact. That's why the person who listens, somehow they get out of their sort of, oh yeah, I'm listening to this music and it's like that and he's famous and that's it's top of the chart and, and all these kind of stuff around things, these concepts around the experience. And sometimes you break through and you just feel the thing. And you, and you realize that what you feel, you know, people can describe it or you might someone say, well, how was it? And you'll say a bunch of things, but you can't really convey what you encountered in the, in the event. So that in fact, even our ordinary experience transcends any description of our ordinary experience actually. And enlightenment is very much like that. En enlightenment is simply noticing that and cultivating a way of, of freeing our experience from being entrapped in our bank of concepts because those bank of concepts force our experience to fit with what we expect it to be. So therefore we're imprisoned of what we're allowed to experience because we have to identify and label it. And we quickly do that ourselves. So when we, so we come, what, what brings you down, you know, when you're really grooving in some, any experience is when something pops up in your mind, how great was it? Oh, was, oh, was how much fun was that? Oh, how good was it? Oh, was it good? Uh, oh, and that's the end of it. And it sucks after that. And then you're dissatisfied and discontented. And you could have been better. And oh, I'd rather see the real Van Gogh. I, I'm not going to go look at this poster of those crows flying around the haystack in Provence and flipping out and feeling the hot sun in Provence and the crows and thinking about just losing myself in south, south of France with Mr. Van Gogh. No, no, because I'm going to be thinking about how I want to see the real one in the museum. Or I want to, you know what I mean? I'm comparing it to many things. Then forget about it. So, so Buddha achieved a level of what I call cognitive dissonance, embracing, reconciling experience, where he could hold the two opposite sides of a duality of things simultaneously and actually see the depth and complexity of things beyond just a bunch of alternatives, what's called non-dual experience. And the Tibetan world is based on that based on that is the fulfillment of the human potential. That's where wisdom becomes love. Wisdom becomes, it's not just the love of wisdom, wisdom is the love of everyone, of all, a love of all life, the love of even inanimate life. You know, I used to be annoyed with my mother because she considered inanimate objects were alive. And we would be walking home from a party on a Christmas Eve or a Thanksgiving or something in some friend's place. And she would see in the junk a broken or slightly chipped up broken plaster statue of Venus de Milo or something. And she, she would make me and my brothers and my dad carry it home. 
And then she'd take, she'd make us haul it over to some guy and he'd put, we'd fix it up and then she'd give it to somebody. She had so much stuff, she had to give it to somebody else. When she'd passed away, people called me up and said, well, Betsy loaned me a fireplace mantelpiece, which I've been enjoying the last 30 years. Would you like to have it back now? I'm living in Baltimore. I said, no, no you keep it. She wanted you to have it. She just called it a loan to make sure you take care of it. <laughs> and I used to think that was so crazy, but she was so wise. I was so stupid. Trees and plants and houses and objects, they are alive. They are wonderful. All reality is beautiful and it's worthy of respect. They just like old people and all animals. All animals have souls and minds too. Don't fall for that crap. Okay, so that's the Tibetan thing. So this scepter is a symbol of compassion. So the union, the union of wisdom and compassion is this, where you hold them across like that. You say that means wisdom and compassion. And when you look at that, what, this one then represents what they call your magic body. Because when you become fully enlightened, you're aware of every cell of your body. Your awareness is in all your cells of your body, not just in your verbalizing brain and image, imagery. It's your, your whole being knows things. Your hand knows, your legs, your feet know, you know, your guts know. And, and you also know, and you can also be on the verbal level as well. But uh, uh, that's your magic body when you become a Buddha. And this is your, your wisdom, knowing the clear light where you're, you're one with the flows, the flow reality of, of the universe or of the Buddhaverse. It's not really a universe, it's an infiniverse. It's not a multiverse or a universe, it's an infiniverse. Okay? So let's now, let's meditate together, okay? Let's do a ritual right now. The only way to understand it, let's do it. So meditate, you know, when you meditate, you should sit up straight, if you can. And if you're in a chair, it's okay, just cross your ankles. You don't have to pop into a lotus posture unless you feel like it, you know, where you cross your legs like that in your lap. You put your hands flat one on another and touch your thumb tips. And you tuck your chin a little bit, let your shoulders come back. So you have good posture. And at first it might feel a little stressful, but actually the reason for doing it so that your nose should be directly above your belly button. Remember, like if there were a line, if you if there were a plumb line tacked onto the tip of your nose, it should touch the belly button. And um, that's a perfectly poised sitting position. And your eyes are half closed, not closed and not wide open. They're they're lidded, but you can see out of just under the lids, sort of around the tip of your nose or a little in front. If you have a small nose. Tip of your nose, if you have a long nose like Cyrano, the tip of your nose. <laughs> and in, in order to create a very boring visual field so that you will learn to inhabit your heart, not always your forehead and not always think that you're sort of, you're running face first through the universe. You drop your awareness to be centered at the heart, in the chest, you know, not in the beating heart, but in the middle of the heart, in the middle of the chest. That's, you know, that's the reason for the posture. And when you need to sit for a long time, you know, Rodin's philosopher, you know, the thinker, Pensiero, you know that thing like this? You can tell he couldn't be thinking in that posture for a very long time without having serious sciatica. <laughs> you know, it's really, that's a lack of meditation in Western philosophy. Believe me, like, like that, the guy is like, he looks constipated. He needs a laxative, that guy. He doesn't need to think, read philosophy. Anyway, never mind. I shouldn't tease him. <laughs> anyway, okay. So now, now meditate. Now, the, what you do when you meditate, you withdraw your awareness within your body. You let your mind settle at the heart, in the center of your chest, a little bit toward the back but not inside the spine and just in front of the spine. Like you had a kind of nexus there. It's like your control center or something like that. It's not a fixed thing, but you just sort of try to, try to withdraw there, get out of your being at the register point of your visual field, withdraw from your visual consciousness. And that's why you leave your eyes half open. 
So to make a boring visual field, just seeing the sort of ground in front of you, that thing. And you, you learn to feel present and awake without being backing up your, you know, being totally involved in your visual field, which is where we spend most of our waking time. Okay, so you do that. Okay, then you imagine melting all your sense perceptions, just letting go of everything, almost as if you were falling asleep and withdrawing to, into your heart center in a kind of cool resting place. But don't fall asleep, just imagine that. And that's called, imagine seeing through all structures and going into open space and just being in the center of that open space. And then from being in that open space, reconstruct your mind and body in some ideal way. Imagine that you're feeling the best you've ever felt. Even though you're still sitting still, you're kind of in a completely poised, alert, flow state. And that you're looking at the, at the world from the forehead, in your mind's eye, not from your regular eyes. And you're in a, whatever you think of as your ideal place, whether it's at sitting on top of Mount Tamalpais, looking at the view, in case you're in San Francisco, or sitting somewhere where you like to be in the mountains or somewhere you once visited. I always think of myself as being in Tibet, south of the mountain called Mount Kailash in Western Tibet, looking southward toward a bunch of snow peaks that are even higher than Mount Kailash, but not much, 27, 8,000 feet. And then with a beautiful round lake in front of me, sitting on a grassy bluff over the round lake. That's what I always visualize and imagine myself. But anyway, you just imagine your favorite place to be and you're sitting there. And then imagine that the beings that you most admire in life are sitting up there in a tree. That's the jewel tree. Uh, you look, supposedly looked at that. That's the jewel tree, Tibet, the jewel tree of Tibet. It's like a giant jack in the beanstalk tree. It kind of grows out of a little island in the middle of the lake. It suddenly is there and it goes way up into the heavens bigger than a redwood tree. And in the tree, there are different like jewels, bubbles, and there are thrones in them. And then on those thrones are sitting whoever you love the most. If you're a deep monotheist, God is sitting there. If you're, and Jesus, if you're a Christian, or Moses, or Rabbi Hillel, or Maimonides, or Rabbi Akiva, if you're Jewish, or the messengers of Allah, we better not put Muhammad, you're not supposed to think of him in a physical body, but there's someone called al Kidr that the Sufis have, who's like an angel. And the Muslims had angels, but not too many, because they're always worried about idolatry. But anyway, think of some representative of Allah there. Can't think of Allah as having a body, or even Muhammad, they get upset. But, but uh, <clears throat> Krishna, if you're into Hinduism, or the mother goddess, Buddha, if you're a Buddhist, if you have any live teachers who have meant the world to you, think of them as being there. And they're just like Obi-Wan Kenobi, after a Jedi master, after he dies in the Star Wars uh, trilogies, you know, quadrilogies, whatever it is, and that they're all sitting there smiling at you and saying, Luke, trust the force, or whatever your name is, trust the force. And and they are radiating light rays, like Jedi energy to you. And it's filling you up with energy. So you can effort effortlessly sit, like as if it was flow state to sit. And you feel like a kind of inner calm and peace welling up within you, not from any outer source, but somehow by the encouragement and the blessing and the energy of all of these, uh, these refuge beings, these beings who are kind of little bit your protectors and your inspirers and your, 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 your refuge beings, your loved ones, if you like. You can put them there too, who love you. And they're all there in the sort of astral body form. 
blessing you. And then ima imagine that all of the other beings, all your friends and even your enemies and your neutral people that you don't know, but you can see them in a vast crowd, all the people in the street who've been celebrating the last days of the freedom from lunacy, <laughs> Kamala and Joe. And uh, imagine they're all there and they're looking at you. They're there in some subtle body form and they're looking at your subtle meditative body. And they see you as sort of reflecting the light of all the enlightened beings you're thinking about. And you can have Jesus and Mary if you're Christian there. You can have Angel Gabriel, anybody. You know, whoever, whoever means something to you a lot, you imagine them there. And actually, if they are really caring and powerful and enlightened beings, they are there because they are present to everyone. The more enlightened the being is, the more infinite their embodiments are, and the more in the countless and innumerable they are. That's the Tibetan legend, the Tibetan myth, and the good sense of myth, is that the compassion beings, the, the good guys are way stronger than Caesar. The, the good guys are not victims of Caesar, no way. They are more powerful than Caesar. Wonderful, legendary kind of story. But the great adept, who was a Mahasiddha, a great adept, Padmasambhava, went to Tibet, he was invited by the Tibetan emperor who was a conqueror. And when he met him at the borderland, the emperor came out with his entourage, his generals and the nobles and people, shamans. And he met this guy who was coming, walking out across the mountain pass. And then when he met the, the guy said, oh, hello, oh, you're the emperor, yeah, nice. I'm, I'm coming, to, coming to accept your invitation. And then the generals and the courtiers were mad, the bodyguards of the emperor, and they said, you have to bow to the emperor. And he said, no, I don't, I never bow to emperors, he said. Emperors, I see emperors rise and fall like dust motes <laughs> glittering in the sun. I don't bow to emperors. And they were very angry and they were threatening him. It's a capital offense not to bow to the emperor. And he said, really? And then he said, you mean I should bow to you guys? And he waved his hand like this. And flames came out of the tips of his fingers, and they all ducked to avoid <laughs> to avoid the flames. So they bowed to him. Actually, you know, it's, you can say it's a legend, but actually, they think the people in the tradition think it's a true story, and that there are magical beings who have such abilities. But they don't show them off just for the heck of it. He had to do that to get to change their attitude about how military might makes right, and that's where power lies. And he was saying power lies in knowing and being a flow being, a being who lives in flow, because there's infinite energy you can tap for a special purpose. If you don't do it just to fool around, but you do it maybe sometimes. We need miracles sometimes, we do. So we, we live, America is a country of miracles. We live in a, in, a, in a planet full of oligarchs and dictators and tyrants, and we almost, going that way ourselves, and we now had a miracle, really. And people are freaked out about it, some people. Okay, I'm sorry, that's a digression. So, so you're meditating, okay? And you're in this ideal situation. And now in this ideal situation, you think about how lucky you are to be a human being. That's the first theme to think about. You count your blessing. You are not only a major human being with full intelligence and all your senses and your health, uh, relatively speaking, with a few maybe aches and pains here and there, but basically you are like that or you wouldn't be alertly here in the Zoom with us. And you you're seeking to do something meaningful and beautiful in life because you love art. And you even are being, are you, you're seeking education and you're not just seeking education just to get a credential. That's an aspect, of course, that might, might be necessary for livelihood, but you are seeking to really develop your abilities and your insight and your sensibility and your ability to appreciate and to create and, and, and what to create. What is, what is it, what's it all about? What is life about? What do people really love? What do I love? And how can I communicate that to others to see the beauties that I see in the world? And that's why you that's what kind of amazing being that you are. And that was not any accident. You did not have that did not just grow out of some gene. That is not, you know, your mom and dad maybe not doing that. 
maybe he's a lawyer and she's a she's a mom, you know, or she's a school teacher, or I don't know what, you know. But they're not doing what you're trying to do, and they but they want you to do something more than what they did, because they know that you that you came with you, you came from somewhere into their into mom's womb, and then. Dad didn't bother her for a while. And then she gave birth to you. And then she nursed you for years. And she knew you were something special. Because you come with your own karma, you know, which is not a ritual in a church. It's a rite of life. It's a rite of putting your seal on life, embracing it, sharing your love with you living beings. That's what you're here for and sharing it in a way of kindling their positive energies and their happiness and their blissfulness from your kindling like a candle that can light a hundred candles without extinguishing itself. That's what you're here for. And your parents know that. So they supported you and they still do. Even if they are gone. Probably if you're young, they aren't, they aren't, but they, they will, they support from heaven or wherever they are, the next life, they leave behind something to support. But the point is you evolved and you evolved from much lesser forms of life, capable of much less, much less re deprogrammable and reprogrammable by the great karma of causation. You know, see, Buddha, Buddha took the word karma out of the ritual of the high priests of his day. And he made karma mean evolutionary causal action. So you, are, you, you act generously. You, you, you learn to enjoy giving. You learn to open your, you have a hand like this because in a previous life you gave gifts. That's why your hand open like that, so nice. And it doesn't have vicious claws unless you attach some false fingernail to look like a, clawing person, but otherwise you have wimpy fingernails. You couldn't really claw anything. You'd break a, break a nail. And you have very soft fingertips to sense and to caress and to feel uh, tenderness and to also play piano or guitar or do all kind of clever things with it. But it really comes from the a hand comes from generosity of previous lives. And it's the open hand of giving a, giving a gift. And Generosity and ethicality. And what is ethicality? It isn't just following rules. Ethicality is, a, is living with empathy, where you imagine being the other persons you relate to. And you know how you, you therefore experience for through there by putting yourself in their shoes, looking out of their eyes, you experience what you do, how it affects them. And so ethicality means you don't want to be harmful to them. When something really displeases them or hurts them, you don't want to be like that. And that's where ethicality comes from. It comes from empathy. It doesn't just come from somebody told you you had to do this or that. That's a, that's a kind of ethics of following rules, but that's not the real one. The real one, is all, the, the real one that's internal is a human sensitivity to others. And we have, we have the ability to identify others. We have what they call mirror neurons. You know, even chimpanzees also do. They discovered it in monkeys in a laboratory. And where else but Italia? <laughs> they discovered empathetic mirror neurons in Italy. <laughs> in a neurological lab, some monkey, they saw that the monkey's brain who was watching the other monkey, the monkey who had been in the previous experiment, that when he was watching the other monkey go through whatever loops they were supposed to do with the electrodes on their head, the one that they hadn't disconnected yet they realized that his brain was going through all the exact things that the monkey that was looping the loop was doing, although he was sitting still. So from that, they discovered what they call mirror neurons, which is why we model ourselves, which is why film, for example, is such a powerful medium, which is why some really bad violent films are dangerous. And when they play them in high tension neighborhoods and stress and tend to have fights and, and uh, gang problems and violence after watching the movie, for example, model, the mirror neurons want to fire by making that person act like whoever was, you know, Clint Eastwood, you know, shooting around a vigilante action or whatever it is. So, you know, there's real responsibility in being a great teacher through the art of film. So, this is what you meditate. 
And then when you're meditating on how great you are, this is where you begin. Because you don't respect yourself enough. It's just surprising. And people say, oh, Americans are so yeah, proud and arrogant, this and that. No. The, 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 even the worst ones who act the worst kind of narcissistic pathological arrogance, which we've all been watching <laughs> all the time on all media for four years now, when they're like that, it's because they actually have no self-regard at all. They have, they're broken by a very sad upbringing. If you read the sister's book, the psychiatric sister's book, terrible situation. And so you don't have a good opinion of yourself because you think you're just a, what does a materialist scientist say? You're 85 cents worth of cheap chemicals in a bag of water. That's what a human being is. And you, have, you don't really have a mind. You certainly don't have a soul. That stuff about being reborn, having future life, being reborn, passing, oh, that's all mythology, superstition, that's ridiculous. We all know that you just come to nothing. Actually, you're already nothing because you don't have a mind. It's just the brain is tricking you into thinking that you are its epiphenomenon. That's what they tell you. That's how you're brought up. And if you're still in a religious family, something you're brought up to think you're a sinner, and you know you have a little spark of God in there, that's a little better, because at least there's a spark of God in it. But you're a sinner, and you're bad news, and you better not have too much fun, or you know, we're gonna send you for, for on a retreat or something. You know? So Point is, you reflect on those narratives that you have in your mind, the myths of your worthlessness that you have in your mind that make you feel meaningless in your life. You're even taught materialism teaches you as if it was a grown up mature thing that life is an accident, there's no purpose to it, it ends in, in everything. If you do anything good, it's, it comes to nothing. If you do anything bad, if you get away with it, it comes to nothing. You might be punished in life. That is what they tell you. That's supposed to be the grown up high science view of life. We have philosophers at Columbia University who used to proudly talk about we, we outgrew teleology. What are you guys doing in the religion department over there? What are you still crazy? What's the problem? What's the matter with you? We know this science. I, but I finally, it took me 40 years to figure it out. But I asked them. Finally, I got after my natural science colleagues and I said, guys, mostly guys, we have some ladies, but says, you supposedly follow a path of experience, experiment, data, and then making hypotheses to account for that data, right? That's what you do, okay? So you go by what you've discovered. You don't go by dogmas and theories. You broke away from that in the 17th century, the Enlightenment. That's when you discovered that there was no, none of this uh, inquisition, you know, God planned for the universe and all this. You discovered that. There's no such thing, right? Right, they say. I say, okay, let me ask you this. Which one of you discovered the nothing that waits for you when you die? And then they go, what do you mean, discovered nothing? I say, well, you're assuring everybody that all they do is blow their brain and they'll be in a state of nothing. Because actually they are nothing because they don't have a mind that's something separate from the brain. They don't have a soul. There was that one neuroscientist, Eben Alexander, whose brain stopped. He had a weird disease and he's flatlined in his brain because he was hooked up in his lab and he, but he didn't die. And he, when he revived, he said, I went to heaven and all this kind of thing, he wrote a best-selling book and they consider him a heretic. And if they could, they would have burned him at the stake because he was a natural scientist, a neurologist, neuroscience. So I asked him, which one of you discovered who got the Nobel prize for discovering nothing? And they get like, what are, you, what are you talking about? I said, well, you always say, what's the evidence of former future life to us? And so I'm asking you, what's the evidence that there's nothing, that there is such a thing that waits for you at death? So after you die, that's where you're going to be in peace and quiet. You're not going to exist, or rather you're going to discover that you never did exist. And there was just this random mutations going on and these epic phenomena. And they get really mad. Because <laughs> what can they say? It's psychotic to think that nothing can be a destination and that nothing is something. That means that they don't know what they do when they talk. They don't, they're speaking meaninglessly. It's not that the universe is meaningless, it's that they speak meaninglessly by saying nothing is something, place they're going. Ridiculous. So no evidence at all, in other words. 
So, but never mind. I still say it. Never mind that. But the point is, you meditate. You're meditating now. I hope you're supposed to be meditating. I don't see people sitting any longer. I know I went out a little long, but you're meditating, and 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 you you're in this wonderful setting, which you visualize to be the ideal setting, like the jewel tree of Tibet. That's the ritual, and you're there in this perfect setting for you to bring out your intelligence, and you're focusing your intelligence about what a great opportunity you have to have evolved into being as an individual, to have evolved into being an ever-changing, ever-transformable, infinite potential human being with a human intelligence and sensitivity. And then, but when you, you don't just meditate, I like just repeat it like a, like a slogan. I'm an important human being. I'm a precious human being. I'm a precious human being. You don't just do that. In one way, you sort of focus on that. But then what you do is you look at where is it in my mind? I don't think so. What is the counter argument in my own mind? And you're going to find it if you look. You're going to find deep down in yourself a sense of realistically, I'm pretty worthless. And it's, I should be resigned to that. That's maturity. And I'm not important. And I can't get much done. And what happens to me doesn't much matter. You go and you look there and you'll find that in your mind. And you can find a religious version of it and you can find a so-called scientific version of it. And it really controls you. And it's, at, it's actually the, it's at the deep level of your depression in life. It's how you're so vulnerable to depression when something goes wrong. And it's why they make such a fortune selling antidepressants, the pharmaceutical industry. It's, it's a huge billion, multi-billion dollar business in this country and in the mo any modern country, industrial, materialist, modern country, because life has no meaning. And then the ones, and then in order to reestablish meaning, some groups of people will go back into fundamentalisms um, and they'll pretend science sucks. And they'll, but then the fundamentalism, unfortunately, will also tell them they're worthless. It's only God is great. Allah Akbar, you suck unfortunately. So it's a different version, they're terrorized in a different way. And we all human beings, not, and it's not an East-West thing either. Eastern societies, all the authoritarian societies, the elites of those societies, they terrorize their citizens on purpose. And the high priests join them, and they twist the religions found by some great people like Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, uh, you know, Muhammad, Zoroaster, uh, Lao Tzu, like tons of them. And they twist the teachings of those which were meant to serve beings to bring out their beauty and to bring out their joy and their life and the vastness and magnificence of the, of the human life, actually. And they twist it around to be something that frightens you, that too, frightens you, and you think you're worthless. And so this is the first meditation. This is what we have done, this meditation. And you just sit and meditate and you think, and for example, imagine if you were a billionaire. Do you know? Have you ever met any billionaires? You maybe you know one, or you know, have a friend or friend, or maybe you have, maybe you were a your father or mother or this or something. I don't know. But if you know, if you ever know a billionaire, they never have a minute of time. It's very hard to approach them. There's like three layers of flunkies in between an individual and them, because they're protecting. Because they they're paranoid. They think everybody wants their billion, right? Partly, but partly because they are measuring value in terms of monetary, like Jeff Bezos, right? How many hundred billion? And then, therefore, they can't waste time just chatting with somebody or just doing something frivolous because they, they, one minute they could lose a billion or gain another billion. And it's like they're precious. Their time is precious, in other words. But you have more than a billion, trillions, quadrillion dollars worth of evolutionary wealth in your fabulous intelligence, your incredibly sensitive heart, and your kindness and your altruism and your human empathy. You are, you, you can save the lives of zillion beings. You are also dangerous if you turn to the dark side. You can join up with weird, proud boys, white supremacists, weirdos, and you can, you can become fascists, you can become Hitler or equivalent. There's lots of equivalent in all kinds of cultures. And you can be really destructive. And as a whole, actually, as a group, 
our meaningless societies based on materialism, maximize consumerism, maximize militarism, industrialize our greed and our fear and our hatred and prejudice and so forth. And we're destroying all life actually as a group by and thinking that it doesn't matter because it's just all nothing anyway. That's the real reason why we don't absolutely insist and we didn't from 50 years ago, insist that people get green and clean instead of burning all this filth and throwing arsenic in our faces and, and lead and, and mercury and whatever. Poor Rachel Carson is sitting there trying to play like Silent Spring. If you look at the commercials in the 50s, you have a little family in the, in the Midwest or in, in Long Island and having a hot dog picnic or some really foul thing wrapped in, a, in an intestine, a really bad car carcinogenic hot dog. And they're having them around the table on the lawn with a little road and then a truck comes by and sprays DDT right into the, right into the lunch <laughs> like that. And they're grinning away, chomping on the corner of the cob, <laughs> eating their hot dog and deceived like that. And poor Rachel Carson's writing Silent Spring and then the, and the big, big food, big ag, big oil. They're saying she's a neurotic, she's crazy, she's hysterical, she's just too bad. And they bury it in the flood of false propaganda, advertising, called advertising, how to, how to create a sick and defective and dependent and freaked out population that doesn't even try to vote. They think they're so powerless. Okay, so this is your meditation. This is Tibetan meditation. Tibetans are semi nomads, you know. Nomads are living up in the high steppe, 14,000 feet. And the yak is there. They love their yaks. They occasionally eat them, unfortunately. They also like to eat them. But very rarely, like the true nomads, they don't just slaughter them and have burgers every minute, every day. They do not. Because that's their wealth, it's the yak, and it produces milk and cheese. And then eventually they get out, then they, they, they do like make dried meat and one yak. They don't, they won't, they never raise chickens and things like that. They don't like to, they don't like to eat animals that one animal is one meal or a few bites. They, they're terrified of such things. They think that's such bad karma. That's a bad ritual. They, but one being, okay, they have to live and the, they can't eat the grass themselves. So the yak eats the grass. And the yak is so neat. Did you know a yak is, by the way, do, if you ever have a pet yak, don't let it slurp on you like a dog, puppy dog licking your face because the yak's tongue is like a sandpaper. <laughs> it's really coarse. And in agricultural language, a yak doesn't graze. A yak browses like what we do in a bookstore, <laughs> meaning it just licks the grass and it takes the blade off the root without disturbing the root. So then it grows another blade, you know? And that's the way they keep green and beautiful, very high altitude grassland without uprooting it like a goat. If you, the Chinese, after they invaded and occupied Tibet and started ravaging the environment, and one of the ways they did is they put a lot of sheep and goats. The Tibetans would have a few of them, but, but they would put lots of them because they would sell the sheep wool and they, they wanted to eat the goat. And then they wrecked, they made deserts out of large sections of the great steppe that had survived there for thousands of years under the Tibetan animal husbandry by using yaks, which are browsing, licking the grass. So anyway, okay. So we meditated and uh, what, what, what is it? Peter is still smiling and what can I do, Peter? <laughs> what can I do, Peter? Am, are we stopping now or shall I go on? Shall yeah, I do Bob, another thing? Yeah, Bob, it, this is so uh, like so beautiful and, and could I, I could wanted you, to tell one story tonight. I thought I would. It's, you could tell it's, tell a story, and I just want to also do a visualization with I did. Like some of the folks that are behind you, or just some of those beings. What it means to be yeah, in well, touch that's with the being. It. Well, I just wanted yeah. people to put up their own kind of being, because I don't want you know some alien being. But the point is this. Oh, let me give you an example. Like uh, the Buddhists believe that if you become enlightened you can multiply your body as many as you want to. And you really don't need to because you're just merged with this infinite clear light energy. And you're, you're without a body, you're just in total bliss. 
But the reason you do is because you have a sense that you have empathy has expanded to identify, you know, human beings have this amazing ability to identify with others. Like people in a family identify with their family members. People on a, on a football team, they identify with the, the other teammates. People in a military platoon identify with the platoon mate. That's why they kind of do atrocities. One of their two mates gets shot and then they shoot up a whole town or something, they freak out. And so human beings can identify with groups in a way, you know, mob identity can be negative or positive, but the human being has re resilience and flexibility of identity. So, so they believe to be enlightened, you have a, an infinite expansion of identity. You identify with all of life. And that you see living beings who are still suffering, you see them as completely made of this clear light and therefore you see their own cells of their bodies as made of bliss. So you see them actually as all right, but you do not ignore that they do not see themselves as all right. And you are, you are actually completely identified with them. You feel you and they are one being. And therefore, as they suffer, which is a mistake that they suffer, they don't need to suffer actually, but they mistakenly do because they're boundarying themselves against the flow energy. So they're fighting it rather than experience opening to it. So it's not, it's not able to nurse them and nurture them and, and feed them with bliss and joy. And they said they're fighting it off because they're afraid something bad will come if they open their boundary. So you, and you can't force them, you can't bomb them into bliss. So you, you then identify with them and you, and that's called your the universal compassion of a Buddha being. And therefore a Buddha, can manifest, they have a certain gangla gangdul de la ditamba, they say in Tibetan. Whatever it is that educates whomever, or the literal word they use for educate is tame. Because <laughs> they consider a person who's driven by absolutist egotism to be like a wild savage being. So they, you, whatever it is that tames whomsoever, that you manifest. So that's a praise of the Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, the, the sort of angel of supreme compassion who has infinite numbers of embodiments. Like I used to go to world religion dialogues with Tibetan lamas and Western theologians, and they would always get, get on the Christian's case and they would say, look, how come your omnipotent deity only had that one son that one time? Come on, aren't you selling his, he's supposed to be omnipotent, what, what's, what's with that? And then they say, they give a long thing about the logos and blah, 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 and then, and then they say, well, how many children do you have? And the theologian, I went, was one particular case. And they say, I have five, he says. And he says, well, you can have five children and you only allow your omnipotent God to have one of them? Maybe he had a few he didn't tell you about, type of thing, you know? You know, maybe, you know, well, this isn't that, don't you think that's the kind of limiting an omnipotent being? How can you limit what you think of as an omnipotent being? They would be completely baffled by that because every Buddha, and it's not only, there's not just one Buddha. There are in one way, at one level, it's all the same Buddha, but in another level, there's infinite varieties. So they can manifest whatever beings need. You know, if you, if you live alone and you are sometimes lonely, but you have a faithful pet, dog or a cat or parrot or toucan or whatever, and you feel so happy and you pet that dog. <laughs> that might be Buddha. Because people who have a pet, they live five, 10 years longer than some older person who is alone. They die off sooner because a human being has to be with other beings. Maybe they don't have relatives or whatever it is. If they have a pet, if they have a doggy, they live longer, they're happier. So that's what Buddhas want you to be is happy. Jesus wanted people to be happy. You know, Messiahs want people to be happy. Krishna wants them to be happy. You know, they don't want them to suffer. They don't want them to be miserable. That's not what it's about, actually. So this is your meditation. This is a homework. You evaluate why you think you are important and why you think you aren't important. And how are you educated to consider what you are? What are you? What is a human being? You know, think about it. Just a bunch of genes running around and you dump your genes someplace, like you deliver the goods, then they trash you. And 
How did you wither away? Is that it? They're worthless, it's just the species. And the species is all meaningless anyway, too. Planet is, is an accident. Maybe it's the only one in the infinite universe. There's no other planet. Carl Sagan is desperately looking, has a big antenna, sending out Beatles music, Mozart, whatever, We're hoping for some echo back with the rock and roll from Alpha Centauri. Of course there's rock and roll around. So there's like infinite, how many billion trillion humanoid planets? Never mind. And also just because we can't see beyond a certain distance because of the speed of light, suppose the speed of the fake photons, um, doesn't mean that there aren't more things endlessly that we can't see. So, so that's the thing. The story I was going to tell was a story about Milarepa, great yogi. I first read about him as, as recommended to me to read by Henry Miller, actually, who said he was the St. Francis of Tibet. He lived in the 12th and 11th centuries. And he was a great, he were murdered 35 people by black magic in his youth because he had a kind of Hamlet story where he had a bad uncle who stole, when his father died prematurely, he stole the family's wealth and oppressed Bhima Milarepa's mother and sister and Milarepa himself. And, you know, very bad guy. And the mother sent Milarepa to, to apprentice with a sorcerer. And he then murdered these people supposedly with black magic because they have such things as well as good magic. They also had bad magic in the, such cultures. And uh, so anyway, he was a murderer. Then he repented doing that. And he actually saw the bad karma of that being really bad for him. And he feared to go to hell. They have a hell in Tibet. They think about it. And he went to a great teacher called Marpa. And he studied, and Marpa tormented him a lot as it gave him a lot of ordeals, gave him a lot of problems. Had to build out of stone a tower of say, six story, seven story tower and kept building it in different ways and then had to tear it down and then build it again. And all of this because of the murders he'd done it made him really suffer. And then finally he got the teaching he wanted. He went off and he meditated for years and he developed this inner heat where he lived more or less naked in the high mountains in the winter and uh, just had a kind of cotton lungi kind of that he lived in the high hills. And uh, many people met him and saw him there, a very amazing guy. And um, he said, what the, you can create this inner fire in your body. And they've, uh, Harvard people have gone and studied Tibetans who can still do that. You know, they can, they create an inner heat like a furnace and, they're, and they can live in ice, they can melt ice. Anyway, he did that. And then there was one particular incident that I particularly like where he, he had one disciple, his close disciple, Rechumba, who after learning a lot from him, went to India and met him some other teachers in India and then got a lot of texts and brought them back. And, um, and then he met up again with Milarepa, but because he'd been to India, he was kind of more highfalutin when he came back. And he looked at Milarepa sort of semi-naked and he was like, the way he lived very humbly, he never collected a lot of disciples, didn't create a cult around himself particularly, although eventually there was a huge number because he was an amazing teacher. And he would sing all his teachings. He was like the Bob Dylan of Tibet. And they still love his songs and they sing them in Tibet thousands of, yeah, thousands of years later. So anyway, but anyway, he was looking down. He thought he was like really super duper. So then Milarepa leads him out on a plane. They're going somewhere. And he has a backpack with all these precious books that he bought from India. And then Milarepa cooks up a thunderstorm out of nowhere and drenches himself and the guy and, uh, and all of his books get drenched in this shower. And then also Milarepa disappears once it's raining and Rechumba's looking like, well, Milarepa, where are you? Where are you? And he hears a little voice and he says, where are you? And Milarepa hears this little voice, oh, I'm in here, come in here, it's nice and dry. And he's looking everywhere and he can't see what do you mean, come in here. And then he looks and he sees there's an old yak horn lying on the desert floor. And then he looks down in the yak horn and Milarepa has miniaturized himself like Ant-Man. And he's sitting happily and dry inside the yak horn. He says, come on in. And Rachel, of course, doesn't have that ability. <laughs> so he's out there, oh, and he's mad. He's getting all mad, it's all drenched. So then, okay, then the rainstorm is over, and then they get to some sort of campsite. And then Milarepa the says, well, okay, uh, let's make a little, let's get some brush here, and make a fire so we can dry out. And maybe you can dry out your books. And why don't you go over and bring some water and we'll make tea. We'll camp here for the night. Okay, that's great, he says. 
So then he goes, you know, of course, it's like a little hill, you know, like half a mile away to a pond and get some water. But, but as he gets to the pond, he sees a herd of a male and a female goat. He sees them. And then they're mating. And then they suddenly produce a, a younger goat. And then again, they are mating. And then like this, goats are multiplying. And there's this whole hillside full of goats. And of course, he doesn't think this might be some hallucination or that's optical illusion because they're growing up so fast and producing goat babies so fast. So, but he sits, he's fascinated by it. It's like a marvelous hallucination. So then, but then he remembers his job and then he brings back the water. And then when he gets there, Milarepa is burning the last book in the fire. And he completely flips out. You burn all my books, you hillbilly country guru and all these great gurus and then they have these fabulous books. And Milarepa said, oh no, oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, you know, I didn't really mean to burn them all. I was trying to dry them out, he said, with a fire. He said, but then I noticed you had a couple of black magic sorcery books in here along with other books. So I thought we should get rid of those. They're polluting the nice book. So then I burnt them. And then I said, oh, this is not a good edition of that one. And, but pretty soon I ended up burning them all. And I, you should have come back sooner. Oh, why didn't you come back sooner? And then the guy didn't say anything. And he was looking ashamed. He said, oh, you were watching a play of goats, were you? <laughs> no, I produced a hallucination to give himself time to burn the book. So then the guy goes totally berserk. And you know, in the high level of uh, advanced practice, not in the sort of simpler levels of studies, the Buddhists do not have an authority thing about teachers. But in the high level, the very advanced yogic teaching, the guru thing is a big deal. And so you're never supposed to be angry with your guru, even if he does something a little difficult for you. So he's freaking out, and he's freaking out that he's freaking out. And he goes on and on. And so Miriam says, well, anyway, why do you need books? Look here, you, I have all the mandalas right here. And then he, he makes his body look like a crystal thing. And you see that mandala diagram behind me? But that's just a blueprint of a, a three building mandala of the Kala Chakra, the Wheel of Time. And uh, which is this tantra that's concerned with the advent of Shambhala 400 years from now, sort of a mythology that they have where the, everything will be great in the world 400 years from now when we get rid of the oil industry. And I, I think the timing is fake because we have to do it now, but never mind. But anyway, that's a mandala. It's like a palace universe, a perfect universe where everyone is beautiful and everything. It's like a heavenly plane, but made in a, made in a bubble kind of. And uh, so then Milarepa's brain becomes translucent and they see a palace with all kind of min miniature deities, but the live actual deities in, in the brain dancing around the mandala. Another one at the throat, another one at the heart, another one at the navel, another one at the genital level. So five mandalas, just like, like carousel wheels of dancing divinities, are all known by Mechima. So he recognizes them, he knows what they are. He sees them in his teacher's body. And then he's still, he's still mad though. I don't, don't show me some tricks. I don't care, you burn my books, you don't know, blah, 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 blah. And so the Arepa then shows them, well, you don't need your books. Look, look at my tongue. And he sticks out his tongue. And then from the tongue, all kinds of syllables come, Sanskrit, Tibetan, Chinese, any language, and all scriptures are, and then he sees pages of scriptures just flowing out of Milarepa's tongue, like books coming out of his mouth. And uh, still, well, that's kind of cute, but no, I do burn my books. And he's still like, and he goes on and on showing one miracle after another about the thing. So finally Milarepa says, well, okay, I guess you've just outgrown your old teacher. I can't, whatever I show you, whatever miracles I do or anything, you're still not going to take it seriously. You're not going to realize that you yourself have this ability if you don't get arrogant about your teacher and behave like a, like a snob. You don't need those books, he says. And, uh, but then I'll leave it. And then Bill Ripper turned into a vulture, which was his totemic animal. And then he flies away into the sky and says, ah, bye, sorry I made you mad, it's too bad. And he's still shaking his fist. <laughs> so then, then Mirechumba gets really freaked out and then he sort of repents having gotten angry and then he becomes suicidal because now I've lost my guru and I've lost my temper just with some books and I'm ruined and I'm going to the Vajra hell and I'm, he just really goes crazy. So then he goes and then he jumps off a cliff that's near their camp, you know, he jumps off. And then, however, he then clunk, he lands on a ledge that he didn't see which maybe Milarepa created, extruded from the cliff. 
Sri knows all his miracle powers. And he lands clunk there, and then he suddenly sees Milarepa in his ordinary form, multiplied in five bodies in front of him, saying, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Say, I didn't leave after all. It's all right. You were a bad boy, but it doesn't matter. Don't kill yourself. And uh, it goes on like that. So that's Milarepa. And oh, the, oh, the, last, the last thing about Milarepa, you should know. Then years later, Milarepa dies, and he dies on purpose. He lets somebody poison him who's jealous of him. And, and I won't tell that whole story, it's a long story. But he, because he's tired of being there and he plans to pass away anyway, because you can't die. When you become enlightened, you don't die. You just change bodies. And um, so uh, he's, uh, he hears, and then Milarepa appears to him anyway, where he is like in the next county and says, come here, I need you to come and attend to my funerary services because I'm leaving my body. And so, okay, I'm coming. And then he goes there. And then when he gets there, the disciples, the latest batch of disciples, they act like they own the, the and who is he? And they, you know, he's like an old disciple. We don't want to even talk to you. Right? So Mil the corpse sits up on the funeral pyre and says, let him in. I, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to light this pyre. I'm not going to burn until he comes and lights it. He's my main guy. Like you guys were just last, last people. Okay, okay, they let him in, then they light the fire, then they see all kind of miracles in the fire. Then one miracle, and, and Milarepa keeps rising up in the middle of the flames, giving more, singing more songs, teaching, teaching. Then finally, the relics, that they start fighting over the relics, They're not Rechumba, but the other ones. And then there's this one crystal stupa that's about that high. And then there's a little Tom Thumb sized Milarepa inside the crystal stupa in the main body of it. And he's still singing to them, giving teachings. And, uh, but then they're fighting over it. So then some angels, female, Dakinis, they call them, sky goers, uh, sky walkers, they come and they take him away. They say, you humans can't keep him. You're just too greedy. And so but then the last thing before he leaves, Milarepa says to him, I want you to go to such and such a cave and you will find my last will and testament. Oh, they get excited. They have like a roadrunner race to this cave of like 20 miles away. And they finally get there and he says, dig under there and you'll find my last will and testament under where I made, used to make my fire when I was meditating in that cave and to make my tea and my zampa and my, my, you know, my granola, you know, barley granola. And then they get, and there's a wax paper thing folded like this wax cloth. And inside the wax cloth is a lump of sugar and a knife and a note. And then they see that. And then the, the note says, this lump of sugar is my teaching. And so each one of you can cut a piece and then all, every part of it has the same taste. So, you know, you don't have to fight over it. So you take the knife and cut it in little pieces and each one gets a piece, he says. And he said, if anybody said, and this is my entire last will and testament to you. And if anybody says that Milarepa used his teaching to heap up treasure for himself, let his mouth be stuffed with shit. <laughs> and that was the last will and testament of this, one of the greatest of all Tibetan. When the Dalai Lama takes this about Milarepa, he weeps. And most of the great Tibetan masters today, when they tell any story about Milarepa, they'll cry about how amazing he was. And I visited his uh, places where he meditated, his cave. I put my head, there's one cave that's fairly low ceiling. And that Mount Kailash, my favorite mountain. And it has a head imprint in it, like the shape of the top of a head. And if supposedly if you sit there and then you sit up and put your head in it, then then and Milarepa made that because he thought the cave was too low and he opened it up by pushing up the lid of the cave with his head. So if you put your head there, you'll never be reborn in a bad way, they say. So that they have these wonderful things in Tibetan pilgrimages. Oh, Siri, don't worry about it. You don't have to take it literally. It's a myth. It's okay, Siri, take a break. <laughs> Siri, Siri likes to get in on the Zoom. <laughs> all right, then. Okay, all right, Siri. It's cool. <laughs> We're fine. So that, this uh, kind of, it's a wonderful, magical thing. You know, that one of the best books that I like about the history of Tibet, Tibetan teaching, you know, this amazing event where the Chinese shattered this Tibetan thing. All the Chinese emperors before that respected them tremendously as sort of magicians and 
but positive blessing magician, bringing the rains, keeping the monsoon flowing. The headwaters of all the rivers of Asia come from Tibet. So they were never really ma messed with by anybody in Tibet for thousands and thousands of years. They themselves used to go and conquer other people before they became Buddhists, and they stopped doing that. And they became kind of mind conquerors or conquerors by, by, by science, by, by mindfulness, by truth, you know, what they call truth conquest. And by but wonderful, you know, the wonderful teachings and the love and compassion and joy and so on. And uh, which is the ancient great teaching from India that they kept alive while India was under conquest by other foreigners, for Westerners, by a thousand years. So um, Tibet is, uh, Tibet is uh, then, yeah, since the Chinese uh, came and wrecked everything, but the Tibetans somehow, so enough of them escaped and they went all over the planet. And the Dalai Lama has, is one of the most popular people on the whole planet. He, has, he doesn't even have a passport. He's a stateless person. He's what in Zen they call true man of no rank. But everyone loves him, actually. He's amazingly beloved. He has, I don't know, 30 million Twitter followers or something. <laughs> Some guys, he doesn't Twitter himself, but he has people who pass on his sayings who live there, who, who decamp to, to India and live nearby him. And uh, he gives teachings online and like you know, 800,000 people come and attend them from every, even from mainland China, even, even though the communists act like he's the bad guy, but they're so scared of him. The PR, you know, the communist party is so silly, crushing the Uyghurs and their Islamic culture and trying to crush the Tibetans with their, and the Mongolians with their Buddhist culture. They're really, really silly. And they will eventually stop doing it, but we've been waiting for 70 years and they just, they do have moments of opening for, for a few years and then they clamp double down again. It's really terrible. But anyway, he, he still doesn't call for violence against them, calls for dialogue, keeps patiently, keep patiently waiting for a response. He does. I do like the guy, he's really special. Okay, any question? What are we gonna do now? Peter. Uh, thanks for an incredible night. Thank you for a really beautiful night. Can we thank uh, Bob for uh, coming to? Uh, Is everybody happy? Happy? Happy-ish? Thank you, Bob. Don't be scared to be happy. Thank you. <laughs> that's what you. That's your job. Seriously, you know, you know this thing about the the revolution. We need a revolution against racism, against like stupid oligarchism, you know, against fossil fuelism and fanaticism, we do need that. But it cannot be another violent revolution because the violent revolutions always produce, since the people who get to the top of that revolution, they have gotten there by violence, then they're like Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, they turn bad themselves. They become violent as rulers. You know, the dictatorship of the proletariat, unfortunately, <laughs> does not wither away. It remains a dictatorship as we've seen. And so it's a love revolution. It's like be, be Black Lives Matter. It's like <coughs> <coughs> democracy matters. It's like be out there in a friendly manner. And like flower children, like we had it in the 60s. We had a taste of it. That's the real thing. It is. Although don't get yourself run over by a tank. You know, because you have to learn yoga, a little bit of martial arts, how to get out of the way, you know, wear a mask. And we don't need antifas and things like that, that we don't need. In fact, if we properly don't create them, then the bad guys, they'll create one to discredit the peaceful people. They always do that. That's a typical tactic. It's called agent provocateur. So we don't need that. We, we should police them ourselves and let get them relax, you know, because it's, uh, we're winning anyway. We're gonna win. Don't worry. We just be happiness. Happiness will win in the long run. And you know, the dictatorship. It did, we need a we need a, a paradise island. So I have a fantasy in my retirement from the university, and Peter Sellers is going to be my partner when he retires, which will be a much longer time from now. And we're going to have a kind of paradise island, and we're going to invite the dictators when they have to leave. You know, like you have to show what's his name, Sushenko Menko or something in the Belarus, beating up people and etc and Putin is one of them. And uh, when they finally have to leave, 
instead of killing them as they fear what happened to them, we send them to this parasite island, we give them Reikian therapy, <laughs> massages, we show them documentaries about all the <laughs> suffering they caused, separating families and brutalizing people and mass incarcerating people and being racist about it and blah, blah, blah. And we get them to kind of relax and be happy. You know? That's the best way, really. You know, dictator therapy, post-dictatorship therapy for dictators. I, I, I want to really work on that. I really do. And they have the emotional plague, you know. Do you know Wilhelm Reich? Peter, do you have your students read course. Wilhelm Reich? Well, no, we haven't. We haven't this term, now. You haven't? Not yet? The function of the orgasm? One of Freud's famous, famous students was one who took the unconscious and the whole thing about the repression and everything into the body. You know, Carl Jung took it into the mythological consciousness and the collective consciousness and the archetypes in that, in that modeling something good. But, but Reich took it to the body and he had what he called neuromuscular armoring and the emotional plague where these people who were brought up in militaristic societies and beaten when they're young into sort of insensitivity and sort of made to suppress themselves, then they can't really feel pleasure. They can't melt. They fear to let go. And therefore they never enjoy and therefore they're abusive and they bully and they rape and they do this because they never actually get positive feedback from anybody. They never feel inside themselves. And they even get to where when they feel flow state coming on in themselves, or what he calls the true org orgasmic potency, what he calls, or flow state, when they feel that welling up inside them, which the human nervous system is well created and well formed and, and, and evolved to feel, they fear it. They feel that they are losing control and they've suppressed themselves. And then they jump around and suppress anybody else who's cheerful around themselves. And that leads to fascist communities and societies where people are repressed. And of course, the repression of women is essential for that. And they're violent with women and oppressive and abusive to women and children. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're not, but that's not going to happen now. They, they, they can't win because they've finished their wars. They can't have a war. That's what they would want to do. They would have war. I love Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter on the, on the late show, he said, he said, well, what are you, what are you doing about the current president a few years ago, you know, the guy, what's his name, Colbert asked him, he said, well, I pray for him. He says, I pray for him, I pray, I pray that God like makes him happy and he has him calm down, I do. And then, then Colbert says, well, do you think God is trying to do that? Well, my daddy used to say, Jimmy Carter says, my daddy used to say, that God has three answers for you when you ask him a favor. Because, you know, I'm, Jimmy, Jimmy said he was asking God to make uh, the president relax and, and take it easy and, and uh, not cause any trouble for anybody. <laughs> God has three reactions. And first, sometimes God says, yes, I'll do that. We ask him for a favor. Sometimes God says, no, can't do that. And then the third one, what, and then before he says, what's the third one? And the third one is, God says, you got to be kidding. <laughs> he says, then, well, what do you think? What are you going to ask God? Well, well you know, but I don't give up. I keep asking, says Jimmy. But what do you ask for then? Well, at minimum, I ask it. And what I ask is, at a minimum, if things go really hard for him, I just hope he won't go nuclear. He says. I ask God to get him to think about it and not to, go, not to use nuclear. He says. Jimmy Carter. Bob, give us one last passage into bliss. <clears throat> passage into bliss? Go. Well, well, the passage into bliss is just be happy, you know. That's the way. Don't be afraid. You know, you can, I have a book called Why the Dalai Lama Matters, and I scare myself. And don't believe me, by the way. Whatever I say. I don't even know what I'm saying. When I start talking, I usually cheer. My, my main job is to cheer myself up, <laughs> and I usually do. I practically feel enlightened by the end of giving a talk. But then I forget about it. Then I'm all worried all the time. I go back to CNN and I'm really worried. And Fox News, I watch that. Oh, no. And then, and then, uh, and we have to reintroduce the fairness stocks. We have to get propaganda out of the media. Listen, Goebbels, television 15 hours a day to brainwash people would be Goebbels' wet dream. You know, Hitler's guy, his propaganda guy, Goebbels. 
It would be a wet dream, man. And we have like unethical and lying people making private propaganda. That's really dangerous because they have so much access to people's brains, you know, through the TV. You know? Terrible. So, and Reagan started that by annihilating the fairness doctrine, where you cannot express opinion without a counter opinion right there, not some fact checker that the people in the cult will never listen to, but right in front of you on the on the air, they're going to say, no, that's not true. That, that's the fairness doctrine. We got to put that back in. But anyway, passage into bliss is simply that that's what you're made for, human being. You know, neuroscientists say, neuroscientists say that the human brain is 90% redundant. And by the way, ladies, they have the goal to say that ladies' brains are more redundant than men's. So we only use seven to nine percent of the brain. That's what they say. But used for what? They say you use for driving your beetle on the freeway. Yeah, you only need seven percent for that, for sure. <laughs> but what is that brain for? That brain is to experience flow, joy, bliss. You have capacity for bliss. That's why we, that's what the 60s were about. That was discovered by us, thanks to some pioneers of that. You know, that's where some Tibetan deities came down and they showed us to not go and kill more redskins in Vietnam, which was that was just an expansion of some stupid cowboy movies bombing those villages in Vietnam by some insane people who had like Indian totems on the front of their automobiles. I mean, come on, wake up America. Bunch of, bunch of Euro trash out there committing genocides. But we are not, we are humans. That, I mean, that's, I shouldn't be negative because we're blissful, beautiful human beings, all of us, even the whiteies. So anyway, there are no whiteies. They're all pink. We have to change next, chan next census thing will not give a category of white, it will be pink. And then with a bracket, pink in search of a tan, unbracket. That's what it is. There's no white people. That's a joke. Everybody's some kind of rainbow color. And, uh, and we're pink. We blotchy pink, actually. After they've been drinking for 20, 30 years, it's blotchy pink. And, uh, and so that's what you're made for is joy. And anything you do, when you do it, you know yourself. When you are joyful and happy, you do it better. And so you have to cultivate that. Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Vietnamese master was wonderful at that, not just Tibet. He said this, when you're feeling down, just smile. <laughs> just, you don't feel like you have no content. Just make your lips go, just smile. And that immediately will produce endorphins in your brain and you start feeling better. <laughs> just, you, even you don't have something to smile about, just smile anyway. And when you meditate, I hate looking at pictures of people in meditation centers advertising meditation. I hate it. It's so bad. This is really ridiculous marketing. And because the people meditate like, they look like, <laughs> they look really freaked out. And they should all be smiling. When you meditate, if you don't smile, you don't bother. It's useless, you know, because happiness is the yoga that we need right now. And you guys are made for it. A human being is made for it, actually. That's what the brain is for. And because it's because of happiness gives you energy and power. You could not do a quadruple axle and land there and then do a triple flip if you weren't in joy in ecstasy. If you're sitting thinking, am I gonna make it? Is it I said, I do it right, I train enough, my muscles, oh no, my knee. You know, that's that horrible. Too too frou frou when it goes splat on the ice, which is uh, every 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 fan's nightmare, right? So anyway, oh yes, I, in my Why the Dilemma's book, at the, this publisher, a lovely woman from Australia, who was the publisher of Shyman and Schuster at that time in that era, some years ago, and not that many, but and she said, "Look, okay, I'm publishing this, and I'm going to put the Tibetan flag on the cover." She said. And my, my editor was frightened to do that because it might make the Chinese piss off. But the Tibetans have their own beautiful flag, actually. I, I want it on the cover, she said. Okay, good. I, I, I was so for that. And then she said, but you, but you have to do me a favor. You have to put it on the back. Since you're writing about a so-called lost cause, you have to write 10 points of hope on the back. So I'm challenged you to do that. And somehow she inspired me and I wrote this 10 points of hope. And the last line of the 10th point, and the point was how Tibet will be free, 
how China will be free, how the Communist Party will be part of a multi-party system, like happened in Eastern Europe, although KGB is trying to change that again, and they're having some success because we're so out of it. But uh, anyway, uh, you know, it's like everything positive, you know, down through 10 steps on the back in this thing. And the, but then the last line I said, and the secret of how we will succeed in this lifetime of ours now is happiness. And it is our duty, and we will win the freedom of the world, and we will win the climate crisis. We will meet the climate crisis challenge and transform the energy system and the agriculture system and the transport system, which are the three things that have to really change. But the agriculture producing poison food anyway, making everybody sick. So that's already a huge thing in the health system is changing the agriculture system. It's the absolute poison, what they're producing. The food is not worth eating. As anybody knows who goes to organic food, who tries to go, they know that. But the masses don't, they have food deserts, right? In the ghettos and these places where the people of color are slammed into racistically. Prison and prison downwind from some horrible coal fire power plant, whatever, or chemical plant. It's really an atrocious behavior going on here. And the way we win is being happy. We have, we're being happy. And that's the only secret, that's the secret to overcome this fear of terrorism that we have. You can't be terrified if you're happy because you're going to be so happy that even if they kill you, you'll die happy. That was my last line, which I really love that one. I do. Not that I wouldn't be terrified myself, but that's what I aim for. I want to be happy enough where I could just die happy. Okay, go ahead, blast me. If it, if it came to that, never mind. Because actually when you die, you go into clear light. Read the book, read my book of the dead. You go into clear light of the void and that's bliss. And there you are bliss, your mind is bliss and bliss knows reality. You know it with your bliss. You know it by melting into it non-dually. It's the only way you can really know reality is by melting into it. You, you become, because you actually are reality, in fact. You have all these kind of structures that make you alienate from yourself, not from some nirvana that's somewhere else. It's in your own heart. And, uh, and if you do that, then you don't fear death at all. And death is like, and actually death, what is, what did the French call an orgasm? Excuse me? Does anybody know? Do you parlez français, anybody? Do you know the name for a slang name for an orgasm or français? Little name? death, I think. Le petit mort, oui. The little death. So that means that's just letting go, right? <laughs> letting go. <laughs> oh. Okay. Bob, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you okay, so much. Okay, Peter. Thank thanks you for so having much. me. A beautiful you know, night. It is beautiful. And a beautiful night, is, Bob. I, mean, I hope you. you're having no smoke there now in Los Angeles. I hope the smoke is not going your way, blowing your way. And I love California, although I'm a New Yorker. But I really, every New Yorker has a fantasy of having a next life in California and becoming a surfer. You should know that. <laughs> but they never do it, though. They never manage to escape New York. However, you know, they we're really frightened for California because in Al Gore's lecture, California gets a drought, goes on like it's now in Guatemala, Honduras, why all those people are coming north and the Pacific coast of Mexico. And the way the currents are going and the raising of the temperature in the ocean, the amount of carbon sunk into the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. And California, right up to UBC, Oregon and Washington, this summer was a big taste of it. It's going to just be uninhabitable in about 30 years if we go on like this. And I don't mean like you're going to have bad times with smoke and then it'll be fine. You can have a nice time. No, I mean uninhabitable. It will revert to desert, actually, totally. And it will both burn the forest, really, all the way to all the way to Colorado. Forget Nevada, Arizona, forget about it. It's, it's going to be destroyed by these people with their oil. So we have to stop it. Because we all love California, everybody does. California, we all want to surf. Surfing is flow state, okay? Like, bye, okay, bye. I'm gonna sign off because I can't stop talking. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> Bob, I don't remember what to I said. You. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, so Peter. Beautiful, you, Bob. So okay, beautiful. thank you.
Thank you, everyone. All, the all best. love. All love, everyone. Okay. And have a beautiful love week, enjoy. everyone. Have a very love beautiful enjoy. week. All love. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a very beautiful week. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a very beautiful Thank week. You. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, that was awesome. Excellent. Thank you, right. Bruce. That was Thank so you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Bye. 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 Awesome. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Maya is my granddaughter. We love you. Just Maya <laughs> and Stranger Things. That's great. All the best. Lots of love. Total Bye. love, Bob. Total love, love Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. online offering was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of membership, please visit our website at tibethouse.us.